Welcome to the Caregiver Reality Show with your hosts, David Levy and Paul Vadiato, who bring you more than a combined 25 years of practical experience, helping thousands of family caregivers, helping them find solutions to the challenges and frustrations presented by this important responsibility. So if you are in the position of caring for a spouse or a parent, a loved one who is no longer able to care for themselves, or if you know someone who is, this hour will be worth the listening. Now, let's tune in to today's edition of Caregiver Reality with your hosts, David Levy and Paul Vadiato. Good evening, South Florida, America, and the world. It's 5 o'clock here on the East Coast, drive time, and you are listening to the Caregiver Reality Hour. I'm here with my co-host, Paul Vadiato, and tonight we have a very special call-in guest who I will tell you about in just a moment. And uh, hopefully you're watching us on caregiverreality.com, wwnnradio.com. You can't watch us tonight on amp2.com, uh, .tv rather, because the station is being revamped. But uh, you can hear us on iHeartRadio, and downstream you can hear us just about anywhere and everywhere. Um, we were just talking with the producer the week before. We had an incredible bounce in listenership. And um, I'm just waiting to get the numbers in from last week. But uh, you've really helped to make the show um, a success out there, all of you caregivers and listeners. And we're very, very grateful for that. And as we head into uh, the Thanksgiving weekend, uh, I wish everybody safe traveling and uh, hopefully... It doesn't snow on your turkey. Paul? Oh, good evening, David, and good evening to our listeners. I hope everyone had a good week and a very happy Thanksgiving to all of you and your families. Uh, week in caregiving, David. Yeah, well, uh, Paul, you had the uh, the classic clean out today. I did. Not me. Not you. <laughs> my not, but my you, lovely but bride did. and yeah, uh, Happened on your watch. <laughs> happened on my watch, and uh, it, it was a... Uh, it was a a tough week. I mean, it was uh, ups and downs. She had a couple of procedures that were done today, uh, not having results at this point. But nonetheless, it's, it's not a fun thing to do. It's a necessity. And everyone out there who is over the age of 50, speak to your doctors for heaven's sakes about a colonoscopy, which is what we're talking about today. It's just so important. And, uh, you know, hopefully everything turns out okay, David. Yeah, well, and looking I, forward to Thanksgiving. You bet. Um, I can't wait going to uh, my daughter-in-law's, get to see the grandkids. And uh, my son-in-law is a phenomenal chef. And so I know that whatever he prepares for Thanksgiving, I know it won't be a turkey, but he'll come up with something great. As they say, I make reservations. <laughs> oh, all right. Well, there's nothing wrong with that. Not at all. All right. And um, Suzette was at the uh, physical therapist. We're trying to get her a little bit built back up. Tomorrow she's at the neurologist. This is a new one. We want to see what's going on with um, her essential tremor and a few other things that go along with the dysautonomia syndrome. And, uh, and speaking of dysautonomia, just as a quick aside, tonight we have on Debbie Dominelli, a woman who I've known now for 15 years and helped her uh, co-found something called the Dysautonomia Youth Network of America. We call it DINA. And she has done a phenomenal job. Her daughter had dysautonomia. Her daughter, Mandy, is now 24 and a wonderful young lady. Uh, hopefully we'll also have the opportunity to have her on and and speaking to us tonight as well but um, as I said this is for the most part a childhood related illness and Debbie has been responsible for the care and feeding if you will and guidance over 15 years of thousands of kids that have it help their parents have guided not only the children on what to do and what to expect as well as been a great resource to the rest of the family especially brothers and sisters who are also caregivers when you have a childhood illness so 
Um, she'll be coming on around 5.30. She's calling in from, uh, from Maryland, at Waldorf, Maryland, and I'm really looking forward to having her on. Great lady. Yeah, she really is. And, uh, Paul, it's yep. probably about time for the world from your perspective. From my perspective, yes, indeed. And uh, in a couple of days, we're going to be celebrating Thanksgiving, the quintessential American holiday. It's actually my favorite holiday. Uh, and it's the official day that we set aside to express thanks for all of our blessings, though they really should be a daily routine. And I thought I would recount some of mine tonight and share them with you, our, our loyal listeners. Um, I'm very thankful that despite many scary days and nights, my bride is still with me and has not surrendered to lupus, which is a tough disease. Oh, you bet. Uh, I'm thankful for the, the, her multitude of doctors who have worked together to manage what seems to be at times to be an unmanageable disease. This is now in our fifth year, and it has not been an easy time for her, nor for me as a caregiver. No, but you've done a spectacular job. We do the best we can. Yes, but you've done an exceptional Thank job. You. I'm thankful for uh, to my support group of one that's you, Dr. David Levy, <laughs> who I can and have called in times of crisis and in times of caregiver fatigue, day, night, middle of the night. Uh, I'm thankful for your wisdom that you've helped all along. Thank you. I'm grateful for this program and you, our audience, who allow us to be here doing what we are most passionate about, and that is to support caregivers worldwide. I'm thankful for the many busy professionals who who've given of their time and talents to join us here on air and to bring you unfiltered expertise and guidance, and especially our producer, Freddie, and his crew for making the technical magic happen week in and week out. I'm thankful to those who follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and help us spread the message for our friends in the Purposeful Planning Institute, who among many have helped provide a forum to bring about change in the world. I'm thankful for our sponsors, medical research charities, art and courts, Sokoff Legal, who helped make this program available uh, for all of you to partake. I am thankful for so many friends who in the last 30 years have given me their support to guide and help me as I sought to fulfill my dreams in helping caregivers. I'm thankful for the privilege, honor, and trust afforded to me by the many, many people who tune in each week and call and ask for help along the way. But lastly, David, certainly not least, I'm thankful for my friend, my teacher, my mentor, and my partner, Dr. David Levy, who had the vision to educate, train, and support unpaid non-clinical family caregivers wherever they may be in the world, and to invite me along on his journey. So from my perspective, the best is yet to come. Paul, that, that was so well said, not because you included me in it, but I think you really rounded up and represented those who've made a substantial impact uh, over this past year and for many years. And I hope that in the coming years, as you said, the best is yet to come, and I hope it's reflected both in Debbie and in Suzette, as well as us being able to continue to bring this program to the world and to be able to continue to impart what we're going through so that people understand that when we talk about caregiving, we're talking about it because we are spousal family caregivers and not just because we've studied it, because we've seen it in others. We deal with it day to day. And so when somebody says, you don't know what you're talking about. Nothing could be farther from the truth. Although I haven't heard you don't know what you're talking about in a while. But, um, but I mean, sincerely, that was a great perspective and I think um, a wonderful message for and, the Thanksgiving week. And to the 60 million plus of you who are out there, who are, you know, that, that silent, hardworking group, we're thankful for all that you do as well in terms of taking care of your loved ones. Because if, if all of you would decide tomorrow that you no longer wanted the job and you were going to walk out, there would be nobody. 
and you are really the silent heroes uh, of non-clinical family caregiving and Thanksgiving is going to be your day. We're thankful for you as well. Right, and and just remember that not only has the formal care system dumped on you everything that they don't want to do, <laughs> but as Paul said, if even half of you, 30 million, 20 million, 10 million, got up tomorrow and said, I can't do this anymore, the healthcare system would collapse. It crashes, yes. Be, because we just don't have trained caregivers with compassion and skills enough to fill the void that families provide day in and day out, 724. And uh, as Thanksgiving approaches, I can only say thank you for everything that you do for your loved one. But just remember that at Thanksgiving, it's also your time. And when people are thankful, they need to be thankful for you, the caregiver, for what you've done, what you will do, and what you keep on doing. And despite criticism, despite family disagreements, despite fighting a system that just doesn't want to work, despite battling of just about everyone, you still manage to do what you do. Get up in the morning, put a smile on your face, and help your loved one. Uh, it's a tremendous responsibility, it is a tremendous responsibility. And, 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 and you've all risen to the occasion. And just when you think you haven't, you have. Understand that there's no clear direction in caregiving. We kind of all make it up every day. Sure, there are basic rules, but it's the innovation, it's the cleverness, it's the care and the compassion that family members show for one another or good friends show for one another or significant others, whatever the category may be, because caregivers come in every flavor, size, relationship, and um, without you and without what you do, there and, wouldn't be an America or a world because we can't live without and you caregivers. Know, David, there is no perfect caregiver. The measurement is that you've done the best you could with what you had at the time, given the circumstances. That is the bar. And sometimes as caregivers, you're just too hard on yourselves. This is a time to acknowledge all that you've done. And I think we said enough on that. David. I, I don't think that we can gild that lily any further. Nope. And uh, because I have some things that I want to say. Um, I'm going to say, Kenny, why don't we go to a break now, and uh, and then we come back. And I know, Debbie, you're holding on. We'll be with you in a few minutes. She's our call-in guest tonight. And uh, we'll be right back, so please stay tuned and uh, take it away. CFC support helps fund research. You can, too. Each year, thousands of men and women serving their country in the U.S. military, as well as other employees of the federal government and the U.S. Postal Service, provide support for medical research to find treatments and cures for diseases. This is done through the Combined Federal Campaign, an annual workplace giving campaign that allows eligible individuals to support charities, such as those that conduct medical research, through a payroll deduction. Money donated this way to the medical research charities and its member organizations helps fund research to fight diseases from Alzheimer's to cancer, multiple sclerosis, blindness, breathing disorders, and much more. The diseases included afflict people of all ages, from the very young to the very old. You don't need to be a member of the military or a federal government employee to support research to help you or those you love that are suffering from an illness or disease. Donations to our not-for-profit tax-exempt organizations are tax-deductible and provide a vital source of funding in the fight to defeat some of life's most dreaded diseases. Please visit the website of the medical research charities, which can be found at medicalresearchcharities.org. That's all one word, medicalresearchcharities.org. On that website, you can learn more about our member charities and make a donation in support of the research they're conducting for a specific disease or family of diseases. You can make a donation to Medical Research Charities itself and support the work of all our member charities. Please visit our website today, medicalresearchcharities.org. Become a part of Joining Forces to Find a Cure. Are you a family caregiver? Are you taking care of a spouse or loved one who can no longer take care of himself or herself? Are you dealing with Alzheimer's disease and don't know what to do? Do you feel burned out, frustrated, and just don't know where to turn? You've tried doctors, lawyers, 
and mental health professionals and have come to realize that they don't have practical answers to these questions. What you need are experts, non-clinical family caregivers with 25 years of active experience helping thousands of family caregivers like yourself. People who can help you provide a better quality of life for yourself and your loved one. Who you need are David Levy or Paul Vadiata. Reach David at david at caregiverreality.com or reach Paul at paul at caregiverreality.com and let them help you pick the right path towards improving the quality of life for you, the caregiver, and your loved one. This is Paul Vadiato, co-host of the Caregiver Reality Hour. Be sure to join us Tuesdays at 5 p.m., 1470 a.m. on your radio dial, iHeartRadio, or live stream on caregiverreality.com slash live show. Be sure to visit us on our website, caregiverreality.com, and like us on Facebook. Join the conversation. This is Caregiver Reality with gerontologist David Levy and caregiver expert Paul Badiato, who asks you to call in and speak with him on the air toll free at 888-565-1470. That's 888-565-1470 to share a story or important information. Now, back to today's Caregiver Reality Show. We're back. We apologize. I think our commercials are getting a little too long, but at least they're not car commercials. Um, Worse, political ones. Or political ones, yes. Um, medical research charities, which I continually promote because I feel very strongly about it, starting next week, we're going to have a number that you can call, not necessarily to make a donation, but to find out much more about what they do and make it easier uh, to be in touch. Once again, you know, this is the holiday season. A lot of people are going to be soliciting you for various charities. Santa will be out there with the bell in the bucket. But um, it's research that really makes the difference. And uh, every one of the organizations that's involved is totally research focused. And you will find amongst it, unfortunately, just about all of the diseases that one could concern themselves about and that you and your family may have dealt with or might be dealing with, notwithstanding the fact that there is a little bit of an emphasis on Alzheimer's because dementia is such a scourge. And that right now, re regardless of what we hear in the research, and we all hope that one day we'll hear something great, um, that right now uh, there really isn't a lot on the horizon, and we're just going to have to be ready to see more of it in our own families and to learn how to deal with it. And I think that that's part of what Paul and I are trying to do. And I just want to self-servingly remind you that the Caregiver Reality Practical Problem Solving Manual, which uh, has won numerous awards over the last few years and just got the Department of Elder Affairs accolade, um, here in Florida is filled with practical advice, not lists necessarily on how to deal with specific items in Alzheimer's, but it is written for a caregiver dealing with any kind of a caregiver problem, young or old, regardless of the disease, how to approach caregiving and how to do the practical problem solving that only comes when you have a plan. And one of the things that this manual does is show you how to collect your information and get it into a plan form so that one day, hopefully never, that you're faced with caregiving. You will have some idea of exactly where everything is, what you need to know, and you will have thought out what are next steps. And I will tell you, I, I run extensive support groups and uh, to you know, the Eleanors of the world who I know are listening and I'll see you tomorrow at the support group. No matter what goes on, I get that phone call at any hour of the day or night. And even though they know that I've told them all there, that I do know, they want to call and make sure that they're doing the right thing, whether it's end of life, whether it's a surgical procedure, um, everybody feels that they want to go back to their trusted resource and Paul and I have certainly earned that trust over the years 
and they feel that we are the touch point to make sure that what they know is really what they need to do. And, I, and I'm just so grateful, not for the fact that they call, but for the fact that all of my caregivers, new ones, old ones, have become friends, not just clients. And I really care. They know I care. And they care about me. And I think that that caregiver relationship they is... They really do. And, and, and by the way, the book is available on our website, uh, www.caregiverreality.com. It's available on Kindle. Uh, if you are a caregiver, it is such a great, just a great re reference tool to have with you. Because when you hit that moment where you're stuck, there's some place to go and helpfully work out an answer. Right. If you want it on Kindle, just look for David Levy Caregiving, and it'll pop right up. And I don't mean to be perverse about this, but it will make to a caregiver that you know, I think, a very effective Hanukkah, Christmas, Kwanzaa, call it whatever your holiday may be. Um, it's not that, it want, that you want to find it under the tree, but if you need it, you're damn glad it's there. Anyway, last week I got on my high horse from my perspective and kind of lambasted uh, Medicare Advantage. I heard from a lot of people who also were of a similar mind that it is very confusing, very difficult to really get to where you want to go and to have to deal with, and this is no aspersions on um, insurance agents, but the only way it can be sold is through insurance agents and they want to make sure hopefully that you buy from them because there's an economic consequence for them in the positive if you do. Um, hopefully as we go forward it'll be made simpler but there was something yesterday that I read it was a survey that came out uh, late last week and we didn't have a chance to talk about it last week um, and the headline was, and I posted it on our Caregiver Reality Facebook site, and the headline was, U.S. seniors' health is the poorest in a global survey of the 10 top industrialized nations, most of which have a universal form of care. Repeat that, because it's really important, David. U.S. seniors' health is the poorest amongst the 10 top industrial nations in the world. We're talking about England, France, Germany, Switzerland, um, Italy, and you can go and read it on the website. But the point to be made was, and, uh, and I'm going to just quickly quote from the author, who was a Dr. David Blumenthal, who wrote this for the Commonwealth Fund. Seniors in America have more chronic health problems and take more medication than seniors in 10 other industrialized countries. The United States also stood out among the 11 nations surveyed by the fund for having more seniors struggling to get and afford their health care. And this goes right back to the confusion of what to do with Medicare, how do I get Medicaid, there are so many things that have to be done. And when you're sick or your family is not computer literate or only can see on a, on a screen on the television a little teeny bit that says zero this, zero that, call this number and find out more, it's not a very effective way to do comparison shopping. 87% of U.S. adults who are 65 and older suffer from at least one chronic illness and 68% were have at least two, which are the highest rates found anywhere in the industrialized world amongst those top 11. 53% of Americans take at least four medications, hmm. another high. The retirement of baby boomers is going to put immense pressure on Medicare and intensify what may have to be Medicaid as the last safety net. And Here's one that I really found distressing. 57% of U.S. seniors said they were able to see their doctor the same or the next day when they were sick, compared with 83% France and New Zealand and 81% in Germany. So that says that only half of the seniors that needed to see a doctor could see them the next day. And unfortunately, what we're seeing in countries that have universal health care 
is that literally from cradle to grave, there was access to medical care that was not an obstacle of copays and deductibles and the rest of the things that ha give us very difficult choices to make in this day and age. And the inability then to discover whether or not your doctor can then see you when you need it, I think has also been one of the reasons that we're seeing such a rise in walk-in medical clinics. They've really become the junior ER and possible replacement for a lot of general practitioners because at least you get seen the same day. And David, in the, in the more rural areas of, of our country, situation is, is, is dire. There's just not enough doctors. There aren't enough doctors. They don't enough. get these walk-in clinics. And unfortunately, um, this is the situation we're in. So when I was complaining last week, I, I, I wasn't trying to stir up a pot of, right. of, of problems. I'm just pointing out what this Commonwealth <coughs> survey came right behind it and said. We have got a very, very sick senior population. And how we're going to deal with it medically and also because the fact that we don't have enough facilities and people that can afford it, this is all going to happen at home. And it's going to require the family caregiver to really understand not just the clinical aspects of it, but how do you deal with the system? And I'll just repeat, if you would like to understand it a little clearer and to have a strategy, please, the Family Caregiver Practical Problem Solving Manual is very affordable and is a, a wealth of evidence based on 27 years of listening to caregivers, understanding their needs, and providing solutions. I'm not being self-serving, I'm just saying, that at my age, everything that I have gone through as a caregiver and everything that I have seen as a professional in this industry for the last 27 years, I've tried to put in a simplified way so that you can benefit from what I think I know and understand and what Paul thinks he knows and understands and apply it to your set of circumstances. Anyway, it's 530. David, before that, just what? one last comment, if I may, on sure. that article. I think what it really comes down to is that we need to strip away the politics that are associated with health care, and we should be focused on access to health care. That's the only way we're going to change the numbers, is take it out of the politicians' hands and simply say it has to get done. Ultimately, they work for us. Right. And whether it's accountable care, Medicare, Medicaid, whatever it, is, whatever it is, the VA, We've got to simplify the system, and we have got to make access to it easier to get to, easier to understand. Anyway, it's 530, and I believe that Debbie Dominelli, the executive director of Dinah and a longtime friend, has been on the phone holding. And, uh, Kenny, if you'd click her in. Debbie? Yes. Hi, David. How are you doing? I'm doing fine. And thank you for uh, patiently waiting for us to get through what we had to say first. Um, you've been a wonderful friend. You've been an incredible leader for families and children that have been suffering from dysautonomia. You are the one that literally introduced me to it at about the same time that we diagnosed Suzette with it, who's now the world's oldest person with dysautonomia. <laughs> Don't tell her I said so. But I'm going to turn you over to Paul because he is our interviewer par excellence, and I'll chime in if I think that there's something. I know it wouldn't be anything that he missed, but that I might be able to embellish. So thank you for being on. Do you think we'll have an opportunity to hear from Mandy, your daughter? I'm hoping so. She's going to try her best to be home from work in time. So. Okay. Well, I'm glad to see, you know, she's she's been one of, uh, what shall we say, one of the the leaders in in showing us what can happen uh, when you're born with this childhood illness and how successful she has become and how mature and giving back she is and I won't mention her age. <laughs> anyway, Paul. Hi, Debbie. How are you this Hi, evening? Paul. It was how are you? I'm doing well, thank you. It was such a pleasure to get to meet you on the phone and have a conversation earlier this week. Uh, you know, while David and I speak about dysautonomia uh, on a regular basis, 
I think most of us really don't understand exactly what it is. So can I ask you in just Disney speak, talk a little bit about what this autoimmune disorder is about. And I, if I remember correctly, you said that it comes in different forms. Yes. So first I'd like to clarify, um, and I think this is very important, that there are different causes of dysautonomia conditions and not all are autoimmune related. Um, Dinah is currently, we're very, very honored to be funding a study at the University of Toledo to explore the autoimmune connection, and that's being done with Dr. Blair Grubb, who is one of the pioneers in this field. Um, and yes, there will be an autoimmune immune connection um, with some cases, but they're not sure that all cases are going to be leading to that. So dysautonomia, to, to word it in any Disney speak is impossible because it's a very complex um, condition. Um, the term dysautonomia, it's an umbrella term for various conditions that are related to a malfunction or a dysregulation of the autonomic nervous system. And this autonomic nervous system is a system that controls all of our unconscious functions of our body, such as our heart rate, our blood pressure, our digestion, our body temperature, um, our endocrine system, the urinary system, and all the things that our body does automatically without us even thinking about it or telling it to do these things. So when something goes wrong with this system, patients experience, is experience issues that are related to all these various areas. So um, there's very... Um, I want to reiterate, there's various di diagnostic terms and types of dysautonomia. Um, in our organization, the more, majority of the patients have a condition called postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. That's called POTS, right, Debbie? Right. All or right. POTS. And just, just for the audience real quick, postural orthostatic tachycardia means that if you have this condition and you stand up and your autonomic system that would normally tighten up your vascular system and keep blood in your brain and in the upper part of your body doesn't react in time and gravity pulls it down and as a result of that many people then faint and once they faint and they're laying flat then the blood normalizes in all parts of the body and they recover um, I didn't want to steal your thunder, but I thought that was a pretty good explanation since I've dealt with it for the last 15 years. Right. And there's also neurocartogenic syncope, or NCS, which is also sometimes called vasovagal syncope. You can go to different doctors and get different terms thrown at you. Um, all these are dysautonomia conditions um, that I'm talking about. And like you said, the symptoms include fainting, dizziness, tachycardia, which is a very fast heart rate, bradycardia, which is a slow heart rate, um, body temperature regulation issues, unrelenting fatigue, tremendously unrelenting fatigue, migraines, digestion issues. And what you describe, Davis, is, David, is orthostatic intolerance, which is the, ability, the inability to remain upright. Um, without having symptoms because your blood volume is dropping and your heart rate is and your body is trying to compensate so it just gives up and wham you're on the floor right well and can they go to the Dyna website and and be able to read about these yes the the spectrum of these conditions since you said that dysautonomia is really an umbrella of a variety of symptoms and not everybody that has dysautonomia has all of these symptoms or necessarily has all of these underlying conditions. Suzette's right. happens to be autoimmune. Is specifically um, easily to read. It's, it's, we worded it specifically for the general public. So it's re easy to read and easy to understood and it's medically endorsed by the top physicians in the field. Debbie, why is this so, so, uh, so few people know about this disorder? Well, dysautonomia is a syndrome. Um, so it has various underlying mechanisms, and that makes it very complex and hard for physicians to diagnose. And it wasn't previously taught in medical schools. It is now, but it wasn't previously. It's also rare, 
and it's an invisible illness. So sometimes the symptoms are not obviously apparent to others. You can be experiencing the symptoms and then go into the doctor and the doctor doesn't see the symptoms. And then if the doctor hasn't treated a patient before, they don't know to look for the symptoms. And I think I read, Debbie, that sometimes it's even difficult for the, for the child or for the parent uh, to recognize that there's really a problem until it becomes more severe. Can you address that? Yes. Um, well, some cl cases do display a slow progression of the symptoms. Um, someone once told me that these are conditions of hindsight, and I thought that was such a good way of putting it. I um, like that. That's very good. Um, many patients can look back and see that, you know, they had experienced the various symptoms for most of their lives, um, but that the full picture did not come into focus until kind of the rug got pulled out from under them. Um, other cases, they have a very sudden onset. One day the, the patient is funking, functioning completely normal, and the next day they can't stand up with, without symptoms. So it varies by patient, um, and it displays differently for each patient. Some experience more GI issues, some experience more migraines, some experience more fainting and dizziness. Debbie, yes. since this has, a, and the dysautonomia youth with the emphasis on youth is obviously something that even though it's rare, uh, appears early on in childhood or let's say in early adolescence even. Um, but since there's no outward, as you said, physical, you know, it's not like you're sitting in a wheelchair or you've got a bandage around your head. How does this affect kids in school? It's very, very socially hard for them. Um, you know, they, they go into school and their blood pressure starts dropping and they have to stand in line to go out to um, recess or to go to lunch or to go to the assembly and next thing you know because they're standing their blood volume is dropping down into their lower bodies and they're starting to experience symptoms and um you know people don't believe them sometimes they think that they're they're faking it you know um often with a teenager it it will be someone will say oh well she just broke up with her boyfriend so she's just trying to get attention um, you know, it's, it's very, very hard socially for them to keep up, and they tend to get isolated. Um, and you really need a cooperative school system to work closely with the parents and the student to keep them involved. It uh, is also a five-to-one ratio of girls to boys with these conditions, and that is because of, of their bodies um, and what goes on in the bodies. And girls have estrogen and boys have testosterone and um, it gets a little complex. But there is a five to one ratio of girls to boys with these conditions. So we're talking about more girls. Okay. Debbie, you, you said it, it's sometimes difficult to recognize. Is there a test? Uh, are there medications that can be prescribed? And what, you know, um, what kind of doctors would be involved? Yes, there, there is a specific test. It's called a tilt table test um, that is utilized for diagnostics. Um, there's also something called a poor man's tilt that a general practitioner can conduct in their office just by laying the patient down and then sitting them up and standing them up and taking their um, stats that way. But typically, the majority of our patients are treated by cardiologists, especially, especially cardiologists with training in electrophysiology. Um, and Sometimes neurologists are, are treating them. Um, and sometimes the parents and the patients have to travel very far to find a specialist that is very, very familiar with these conditions. And wouldn't you say, I mean, I know the answer to this question, that one of the problems that we've historically had is that there really is only a handful of real experts out there now that they're starting to make uh, medical students more aware we may grow out the population but I remember 15 years ago or 16 years ago when Suzette was diagnosed it was Blair Grubb who you just mentioned at the uh, Medical College of Ohio at the University of Toledo who was one right. of the only or people Vanderbilt that he even knew Mayo. what it was about right um, now I can say with, with tremendous honor that I do hear from more doctors every day um, that are seeing patients wanting to learn more about the conditions um, and 
you know, starting to treat the conditions. Uh, but to get to, to the ones who have treated them long term, seen everything, know everything, those are the handful that we do talk about as being the top dysautonomia specialist. Um, most of who are on our medical advisory board that, that we deal with on a regular basis. Um, but it is good news that, that more and more doctors are starting to treat these conditions. Debbie, regarding the, uh, the onset, uh, you had mentioned to me when we spoke earlier in the week that sometimes uh, there are triggers that uh, will activate it. Can you talk about that a little bit? Right. Well, there's, there's triggers for activation um, and, and trigger you know, of the symptoms and for the onset as well. Um, so for onset triggers, that would include a genetic component. Um, they have found that, that in many patients there is a genetic compo component which leaves you predisposed to have these conditions. Um, also, with the youth population, the onset is often common at, at the onset of puberty, right around when the girls start their menstrual cycles. Um, and that relates to what's going on physiologically in their body at that time and brain development at that phase as well. Uh, also, another type of onset would be the Epstein-Barr virus. Um, a lot of patients report viral onset. The good thing about that is they stand a really good chance of, of rec sooner recovery. Um, some patients even report onset after a neck or a spine injury, and even after a severe emotional distress that's just pushed the body physiologically over the edge. Um, not that it's a psychological condition, but that the body just had more than it could tolerate at the time. Um, that can be a trigger. And pregnancy, post-pregnancy can be a trigger for women. Okay. Debbie, I got a question for you. Um, while you do deal with the children, give me a little idea of what mothers and fathers who are caregivers um, how do they first discover, besides getting to a doctor, or do they also have to benefit from hindsight to see what, what's going on? Or, uh, and when they come to you for the first time, what's the most important thing that you tell them or that they ask? Well, they're absolutely desperate when they come to me. So one of the first things I tell them is that everything is going to be okay and they are going to get through this because they are and everything is going to be okay. Um, and, you know, take a deep breath and um, we'll help them. We will guide them and get them through this trauma. So that's one of the things I tell them. Um, some parents, they notice the symptoms and they instinctively know something is wrong with their child, but they can't put a finger on it. Um, and then they search on the Internet and they find, um, you know, okay, it looks like it could be this condition. Um, we have had parents that don't believe their own children um, who, for whatever reason, just, you know, are so busy with their own lives that they don't understand that um, Sally is laying around in bed because she really, really, really is feeling horrible, not because she just doesn't want to go to school. And how does this affect their brothers and sisters who indirectly become caregivers or the bearer of some of these same symptoms and syndromes? I don't mean that they have the condition. And, right. and the B part of that is how many times do you find multiple family members that have this condition? Well, it does run in families, but that doesn't mean that every family member is going to have it to the same degree as actually every family member will not have it to the same degree. Um, it is very common in, to run in families. I myself have POTS. My onset was at menopause. I had already run this organization for, what, 10 years before um, I was diagnosed. And I, so I was very lucky that I, or unlucky, because I had to experience it through my daughter, that I knew about the conditions. Um, but what I experience is nowhere near what my daughter experienced. And if siblings have the same condition, it's usually not the same. Um, what was the other part of your question? I, I simply asked, um, now I know your son Richard. Richard. And, yeah. and your uh, um, siblings. And, right. And I was just um, wondering, how did he respond when he discovered that his sister had the what was the the kind of the impact on on a sibling as the big brother he was very protective of his sister and so he dealt with a lot of guilt 
Um, and he used to say that he wished it was him, not her. And we found out many years later, like really just in, in the – Richard's 29 now, and we found out just a few years ago that he dealt with a lot of stuff in school that he didn't tell us about because he didn't want to add to the burdens that we were al already dealing with with our daughter. Very typical. Um, and so the siblings go through a lot of stress. We did put him in counseling, um, which is often recommended um, because of the, the stress that it puts on families. But then our insurance changed, and we didn't have a counselor for him and everything. Um, the, the system. Siblings, you know, do go through tremendous guilt, stress, lifestyle adaptations because we can't be as active of families as we used to. He had to give up piano lessons because she was so noise sensitive. Um, and he had tremendous talent on the piano. Um, but it also brought them so close together. It either makes or breaks relationships, and that goes for marriages too. Many, many marriages split up because of these conditions or because of any chronic stressful condition. Um, you know, stress makes or breaks relationships, and um, you either become better or bitter. Well, that's, that's a very interesting way of, of putting it. Paul, I know you have a yeah, question you uh, want to... Uh, Debbie, we're going to take a short break, and when we come back, I uh, want to talk a little bit about Dinah and uh, the All organization. Right. All right, okay, so y you hang on, and we'll be right back. Kenny? All righty. Are you a family caregiver? Are you taking care of a spouse or loved one who can no longer take care of himself or herself? Are you dealing with Alzheimer's disease and don't know what to do? Do you feel burned out, frustrated, and just don't know where to turn? You have tried doctors, lawyers, and mental health professionals and have come to realize that they don't have practical answers to these questions. What you need are experts, non-clinical family caregivers, with 25 years of active experience helping thousands of family caregivers like yourself. People who can help you provide a better quality of life for yourself and your loved one. Who you need are David Levy or Paul Vadiata. Reach David at david at caregiverreality.com or reach Paul at paul at caregiverreality.com and let them help you pick the right path towards improving the quality of life for you, the caregiver, and your loved one. Hello, South Florida, America, and the world. This is David Levy, co-host on the Caregiver Reality Hour and talking to you live from South Florida. We have a show that no one should miss because we're talking to 50 million caregivers in the United States and probably 100 million around the world. It's an opportunity to hear what the experts have to say and more importantly, if you realize that the market for caregiving is as enormous as it is, you should get in touch with us because we're looking for certain select advertisers that want to be part of the caregiver reality and those of you that want to be part of the caregiver reality family get in touch with us david at caregiverreality.com paul at caregiverreality.com we'll get back to you because this is too important in your marketing to miss this is caregiver reality with gerontologist david levy and caregiver expert paul Badiato, who asks you to call in and speak with him on the air toll free at 888-565-1470 that's 888-565-1470 to share a story or important information now back to today's caregiver reality show we're back, and we've been talking with the executive director of the Dysautonomia Youth Network of America, Debbie Dominelli, who not only has dysautonomia, which we've been discussing, as well as her daughter. We were just describing the impact on her family, which is very typical, it, just as it is with dysautonomia, with so many other childhood and adult afflictions that break up a family, that cause siblings to have to give things up who feel guilty that they can't suffer mm -hmm. along with their loved one, their brother or their sister. And uh, these are issues that people don't recognize. And Debbie, I'm going to let Paul take over. We'd like to hear more about the organization Dinah. So, uh, Paul? Yeah, Debbie, uh, you founded Dinah, and uh, I know it works to support children uh, that are dealing with one of the forms of dysautonomia. Can you tell us a little bit about the organization and the kind of services and support that you give to the kids? 
Yes, actually, we found a sign, of, as David said, back in 1999 when there was no information about these conditions available. Um, and that was considered the dark ages. And nowadays, because of the growth of the Internet, there's a wealth of misinformation. It's just the opposite. Um, so it's really important for the patient population to get accurate, reliable, trustworthy information. And we serve all age ranges, not just children. Um, so I do want to make that clear. Our members can join our up to age 26, and we, as long as they're happy and want to stay with us, they stay with us um, and grow with us and continue to serve with us. Um, we have, you know, we have a nice mission statement, and um, it's very pretty, and David helped me write that, and it's on our website where people can look it up. Um, but basically what we do is we serve the entire population of dysautonomia patients across the world. We have members from Scotland, Singapore, Australia, New Zealand, and all across the United States. Um, and we field inquiries from all age ranges, patients, families, teachers, relatives, doctors, employers, uh, you name it, aunts that don't believe or um, grandmothers that want to understand. We provide one-on-one um, -on -one mentoring. We promote awareness and educational resources, research funding, and we connect the, um, the individuals who join our programs to, um, to peer connections. Uh, my favorite program, my absolute favorite program, which you will never get me to shut up about, <laughs> is the ambassador program. Um, in this program, we accept members up to age 26, and like I said, they stay as long as their heart desires, and we have, um, they work together as a team, they support each other, they're absolutely amazing. Um, their parents are also welcome to join a, a group for the parents. Um, they connect via a private internet form where they can share the process of living successfully while pursuing their recovery. And they're just such an amazing, David will tell you, they are so inspirational. Um, I could rant and rave forever about the, this. These well, things. we'll give you a different time to rant and rave forever, yeah. but the Dinah Ambassadors really, I think, make and shape what Dinah is all about and and one of the things i know paul wanted to ask you so i'm gonna i'm gonna jump in and just ask it because i'm talking right now is the website for the kids and the we know in this day and age that security predators etc just give us a little a little more understanding i know but but how is it that you've made that so secure that these kids can truly share the the intimate parts of their lives as it relates to the disease well, as we well as a, their own social well-being we have a very supportive technical team with lattice group and rockville maryland who donate their services to guide us um and from day one we have taken internet safety and security extremely seriously um we have a membership process for the patients to apply for the youth ambassador program First, they agree to an honor code, um, and then they have an interview process. And when we changed our website and updated it, I asked our youth ambassadors, did they want to remove the honor code now that we have a really good population involved? They added three more things. These patients, they want to connect with positive beings. They don't want to waste their energy. Um, and so they added three more things to that honor code. So then each patient gets a private interview where we um, talk about the organization, we get to know them, and then that's when we connect them. And then we have great moderators. And the first generation of patients, they have grown up to be doctors. We have two doctors in Dinah, nurses, physical therapists, um, uh, uh, counselors, farmers. Those are the people that they are growing up to be successful people in society and they have stayed with us and they work as our forum moderators and um support us through that so and that, that's wonderful debbie i mean environment yeah oh, that's awesome it's awesome i Paul? think debbie one of the most amazing things about diana is that it runs entirely on donations uh how can people get involved if they want to help out well, they can do, they can log into our website, which is www.dynainc.org, 
which stands for DinahInc.org, and they can donate via Just Give there. They can call us at 301-705-6995, um, or they can just, you know, donate via the website Just Give, write a check. Um, all donations are tax deductible, and there is no amount, amount that is too small. Sometimes people are afraid to write a $5 check. A $5 check from a lot of people goes very far. And the website again, please? It's www.dinainc.org, D-Y-N-A-I-N-C.org. Uh, in the last few minutes... If you want to talk to her. Oh, oh Mandy's there? Ma yep. Did you want me to put her on? Would you? Sure. Here she is. Mandy? Hey, it's Mandy. All right, we only got a couple of minutes, but I wanted to tell you just how proud I am. I've known you now for 15 Aww. years, from being a, a little kid to being somebody who is out there giving back. You work for a number of charities. You help your mother run this organization, and you've been a, a guiding light for the kids on the website. And so part of my question to you is also accolades for everything that you've done. If you well, had, you. One, we couldn't have done it without you, David. So well, I mean, that that wasn't the reason I said it. But I, if I if I were to ask you one thing that you would like to tell kids, and we only got a minute, all right, who have dysautonomia, what would it be? It would absolutely be that there's hope out there. There's plenty of people like my fellow youth ambassadors who, like like Debbie just said, they're living really full lives. Even with a managed condition, you don't necessarily have to recover fully. You can still live a really full life. You can still do what you want to do. Uh -huh. and you can still make it work. Mandy, I'm sorry that we couldn't get you on sooner. Uh, one day I'm going to have you back because I think you're even more articulate than your mother is. So I want to thank the both of you. I'll be in touch with you after the show. And to South Florida, America, and the world, thank you for listening. We'll be back next week. And Paul... Thank you for listening. Have a wonderful Thanksgiving, and caregivers, take care of yourselves. Good evening. Thanks for joining us for this week's Caregiver Reality Show. Each week, David Levy, a gerontologist, and Paul Badiato, a caregiver expert with a combined over 25 years of experience providing practical and realistic help to caregivers struggling to keep up with the needs of a loved one who are unable to care for himself or herself. To reach David Levy, email him at david at caregiverreality.com or to reach Paul Badiato, email paul at caregiverreality.com. And find out more online. Just go to caregiverreality.com. See you next week for another exciting show of Caregiver Reality.